Okay, well, Christmas is coming, and uh, there's been a lot of chatter in the evangelical Twitter sphere. Hey, who's on Twitter? Caleb is on Twitter. Caleb is on Twitter. Okay. Yeah, okay. on Twitter. So much to learn, aren't there? Um, <clears throat> there's been a lot of chatter on, on Twitter this last week about the evils of Christmas, uh, and Santa Claus in particular. This, this year, the popular whipping boy has been Santa. And uh, <clears throat> so you get... You get guys like uh, John Stevens, the guy who heads up the FIEC, getting quite right wing in some of his comments, sort of right at the Daily Mail, which is enough, you know? And uh, yeah, he's been really getting quite unusual things, occasional comment. But he's been, he's been saying some things recently about fundamentalist Santafarianism. Uh, <laughs> that's helpful, well done. Um, so yeah. he's the biggest, the biggest outreach opportunity of the year, let's spend it whipping Santa. Uh, no, I did, I did sort of phrase and reply to him, it was exceptionally witty and exceptionally cutting, and I thought we can't post that, so I, bl I blotted it out. But uh, it's a bit of a long goal, really. People pointing out, for example, that Santa is an anagram of Satan. That's always a helpful one. Yes, thank you very much. That'll really help us with our outreach this Christmas. And then John Piper, of all people. Of all people, John Piper. I know he's getting old and stuff, but he's been really sort of slamming into parents who, you know, how can they possibly trust Christ if they teach their children about Santa? Which is, it's a bit extreme. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I thought, well, hang on now. If, as Christians, we want to sort of cut the crap out of Christmas, maybe we should start on our own doorstep. Because we <coughs> put an awful lot of rubbish into the Christmas story. So, Santa Fe. Oh! It's there! It's there! Santa Fe. Uh, here's a quick challenge just for fun. How much of what you see in this picture of the traditional nativity scene is borne out by the biblical effect? There was a baby, there was a mum and a dad, a there was a star involved, Angel. that was what it looked like as an interesting question, because that's been a debate. Angel? <laughs> oh, okay. Over the major? Hmm. Yeah. 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 Palm in the background? <laughs> no. It's not so deep. No. Um, <coughs> there's a straw? Was there straw? Probably. Do they, do they have straw? There's some sort of bed. Did they have like... It wouldn't have been weeks yeah. before. <laughs> palm trees. No, not palm no. trees. They didn't have palm trees. They've well, they would have had palm trees because it was Palm Sunday. Little drummer boys. They've got... Or rubber pom pom. Yeah, no. They've got these <laughs> stall lids in the top um, of the stable. There's a shepherd's crook. A, a stable. Did somebody say stable? They've got wheat stall lids. Oh, was, like was, was, was there a stable? Yeah, but there's wheat what, stall lids. What, what, yeah. Was there a stable? No. Yes, but it says no. nothing. It, not in the way that we think. And did the shepherds bring lambs? Don't know, they bought a cloth by the look of it. <laughs> well, they left their sheep in the fields and came. Yeah. That one's blue. <laughs> that one's blue. <laughs> what one's blue? Oh, the shepherd is He's blue. Cold. The other yeah. one's green. The shepherd is a wise man. No, that's a shepherd. No, green. Look, the, the wise men on. on the camels. That's very interesting. In this picture, there's a witch. There are shepherds on camels as well. <laughs> no, 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 it's the wise men. There's a no, monkey. There's three of them. Was there three of them? Because what happens is that memories of time past get bound up with what we take the scriptures to be saying. And we don't want to have the cobwebs dusted off our misinterpretation of scripture. Yeah. See what I mean? Mm -hmm. This is where it becomes an issue, isn't it? So here's an illustration, okay? And it's, it's just well, it's by way of appeal. We, we've got at least three proper jewelers in the town, yeah? This very small town. At least three proper jewelers, by which I mean people who design and craft items for decorative purposes, the gold and silver and precious stones and, and all that, and they sell these things to the affluent public. Those sorts of proper jewellers, not, you know, the signs. I wouldn't want to say that, <laughs> <laughs> but you said it. <laughs> so these affluent people, they then bring their treasured things back to the jeweller from time to time to be clean. That, that was a mystery to me, I didn't, I didn't 
perhaps they're not dusters in their own house, I don't know. But, but they bring these things back to be cleaned, right? So oh, I clean, you know, so, oh, I clean it. Take a glass, and pour some coke in it, dip it in, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, how does it work? How complicated is this? Yeah, I'm shaking it me, I know, it's terrible. Um, but <laughs> the thing is this, and the thing I'm getting at is this. When they're treasured, precious things are treasured, they get used. And when they get used, they pick up a pattern of stuff that accrues and sticks to the surface of their treasure, which distorts the light that falls on it. And they need to be cleaned, and, and that stuff's got to be removed if the true character of the treasure is to be evident and plainly seen. And the value of those things is not diminished in the process, but enhanced. Yeah? And so it is with most of our treasured, most used, most loved, most heavily patinated passages of scripture. And so it is with the ones about Christmas. Our vision of them sometimes needs to be taken out and polished so the stuff that's got picked up and stuck to their surface can be removed and our treasure's greater glory can be more clearly seen. A clearer vision results from that sort of process, not a reduced one. So if we're going to start with ourselves and try to put the genuine Jesus Christ back in Christmas, what are we going to need to polish off first? There's the birth. Let's just check what did happen here, and, and try and rub the pattern off the lily a little bit if we can. Firstly, verses 1 to 3, there was a census declared. Yeah, do you have that open with you? I'll, I'll have mine open too, because I'm working on scanning. Luke 2, 1 3. What page number there? 1027. 1027. Luke 2. So in those days, a decree was issued by Caesar Augustus that the whole Roman world should be taxed. Roman command. Jesus is growing up under oppression. He's growing up in a situation where a Roman army has come into the place, has overthrown the prior people with a long history, taken away the symbols of their individual identity as a nation state under God. And bear in mind, this is one of those, not where they've lost the inheritance, but they've lost the calling. And are now oppressing them. And the reason a census is taken is not to see how, how many schools they're going to need in 10 years' time. The reason a census is taken is not to work out what sort of provisions are going to be necessary for the old people, lunch clubs, and stuff like that. The reason the census is taken is that Rome has big bills to pay, and Rome pa pays those big bills by oppressing subject peoples and ripping off their stuff. And the reason that the census is being taken is that sort of taxation can be more effective. And they're making you come, and they're making you register, because they're going to make you pay. And nick your stuff. And because of that, Joseph and Mary, as a result of that, in the providence of God, as a result of that nasty experience, that ghastly thing that's going on, Joseph and Mary are placed where they need to be placed, to fulfill Micah 5 2. So you, Bethlehem of Rata, least among the tribes of Judah, out of you will come a ruler who will be the ruler of my people Israel. Yeah? Census is going on. And in that background, God sends his son to save the world. <laughs> Crazy, isn't it? Clan. Uh, <clears throat> okay, verse 4. Clan. This took place while the, uh, the first was the first census took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to his own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. So there's, there's good historical stuff here. He went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee, which was at low level down by the Sea of Galilee, up into the hill country of Judea to Bethlehem, because he belonged to the house and lineage of. Now, it, you see, where Romans are, the Romans are concerned, you know, tribe and clan doesn't actually matter. They've got their own sort of hierarchies and they're all in Rome. 
But for this people, there's such a thing as a clan structure. There is an inheritance. There is a family. There is a decent family. There's David's family. David was the royal family. So Joseph, bringing this girl up with him, is of the house and lineage of David. And Joseph's doing a good thing. So we've got this picture in our heads of Joseph. Poor old Joseph. Can't even manage to book a B and b for his missus. Poor, poor Muppet, he's sort of lumbered with this girl who's, who's gone and got herself pregnant by somebody else and it's, it's all bad and he's, he's on the back. No. What happens in an Eastern setting with a girl who has found, been found pregnant outside of her marriage? She's, she, she'll be grabbed by the villagers and jostled and stolen. Now Joseph's got to go up to register. She hasn't got to go up to register. That isn't required. That never was. So what he's, got, what he's doing is he's taking her with him to make sure she's going to be all right. She's coming with him. He's not leaving there with her. He's standing by this woman, he's taking responsibility, he's taking care of her. And he's taking her up as a decent guy, and he's taking her up to his hometown, where he has status and standing in society, because he is of the house and lineage of David, in that place. And they're proud of the Davidic roots. So he turns up with his companion, verse 5, who's a pregnant lady, that's not his baby. He is the guy who is manning up and taking the responsibility and showing the leadership. He's not some poor little couple stuck in a corner. He's a guy who's taking it on. He's committing. We live in a day and age that there's a message there, isn't there? <laughs> because we live in a day and age where young guys won't volunteer for anything. I told you about that earlier on tonight. My recent experience of that this week. Guys will man up and take responsibility and take, you know, just read of it. Here's David. House and line of David, royalty in town, and he's taking back with him to his hometown. This girl was pregnant, but it's not by him. She shouldn't be pregnant by him yet. He's taking this on his shoulders, isn't he? What a guy. He's the hero, isn't he? He's a hero. He comes home with his companion, and, and recently, you know, in the television and film and stuff, she, she came riding on a donkey, and it was raining, and it was wet, and he was going around pounding on doors and trying to be let in, and there is no way. There is no, no way on earth that's going to happen to a guy who was of the house and lineage of David in a town like Bethlehem. No chance. It's unrealistic. It's not actually in the biblical account either. It's not there. And then there's this childbirth thing. Now, isn't it always presented to us like this? Poor Mary, on her own, turns up on a donkey heavily in labour. You know, she's like eight centimetres already by the time she arrives, yeah? And off she goes, and she's on her own, and it's like donkeys everywhere, and dirty old stable, and crap on the floor, and... Uh, uh. Is that what it says? It says, while they were still there, the time came for her to be delivered, and she delivered the son. It's giving us the impression she'd be no why. And in the normal course of events, she gave birth. While they were staying there, not on the way, not as soon as they arrived, while they were staying there, the child was born and was wrapped in swaddling. I'm thinking, oh, poor little kid, he didn't have one of those baby grows from Marks and Spencer's. The way it was done for ordinary children in those days, what the shepherds who came later would have been used to seeing. It's the normal thing. For ordinary people. A nice but normal poor. The manner of peasant babies placed in a manger. And the reason given is the unavailability of the guest room. Not of a Bernie Inn. No, travel inn. Or anything like that. The reason given is that the guest, there was no guest room available. The public conception is there's no room, and the inn turns them away. And so they have to find a stable round the back. It doesn't say any of that. And there amongst the animals, it doesn't say that. Lonely birth, insalubrious surroundings. Look at the condescension of the Son of God. And the people who couldn't look after him properly. Because in an Eastern context,
be allowed to happen. If the shepherds had come and they'd seen that when they came, the immediate response would have been, you come with us, we'll take you, our woman will look after you. You come with us, young lady. It never happened. So what did happen? There was no guest room. Because it was an ordinary home. You used to have two room houses. Okay? I'll show you something in a minute. And in the family living room, there'd be a raised area where people would sleep. And into that space was brought the few animals they had overnight to be safe and to help the family keep warm in the cold of an eastern evening, the night. And they'd be taken out in the day and swooping up and so on. And that's why there were mangers in the living room. Come to that in a minute. I've accepted a family living room. Family around to help because they always were. The guys would be shooed out and the women would take over. Baby wrapped, baby put to bed in the manger, filled with fresh straw. Oh, poor baby Jesus, on straw. What did you sleep on in those days? Have you ever spent a night on a bed of straw? It is, yeah, it's really good. It's a really great place to sleep. Why does it matter? It matters, first of all, if truth matters. And it matters because the big emphasis on the physical deprivation and humiliation proposed detracts from the actual humiliation of the incarnation. It is not that Jesus didn't have a baby grow or a travel cot for mother care. That's not the humiliation of the incarnation. The humiliation of the incarnation is that the great creator makes himself a house of clay, an ordinary life. That he who was rich became ordinary poor. So that we through his poverty might be and if you start majoring on the physical aspects of all of this, you lose the spiritual implications of the incarnation. Is that what our nation has done? It's lost the spiritual implications of the incarnation. The policy did, did not consist essentially as being born in a stable, he wasn't, but in God taking the form of simple human flesh and being born, taking on our constraints. It is humanity that's humbling, not its circumstances particularly. Humanity is a humiliation trip. Not its home, it was a good home. It was an ordinary home. It was a home under the circumstances where the shepherds could come along and see it and go away re re rejoicing. But it was all good. God's already, in the birth of Jesus, coming to and showing his acceptance of the ordinary people of his day. The ordinary people of his day. And given the background in Judaism at this time, you had to be rich to be a Pharisee because you couldn't do what Pharisees had to do to gain their points unless you were rich. Uh, I've lost it. Go on. <laughs> Stick around that. That's fine. If the exception to a family's living room, why do you, I mean, that would be the first place if it was a family's living room. Why does it say then in the bottom of um, verse 7? Because there was no room for him. It doesn't. Because there was no room. It doesn't for say that. Him. It doesn't say that in the, in the text. It says that in your translation of the text. Serious. It doesn't say there was no room for them in the inn. It's, it's a guest room. I'll, let me come to it. There are two, okay, I'll do it now. There are two distinct, clear, separate words. When the traveller in the parable of, in, in Luke's gospel, the parable of the Good Samaritan takes somebody to a public inn, there's a word for it. And he uses it. Luke uses it. Luke is very good with language. Luke is very good with words. Okay? He's, he's, his Greek is excellent. I'm not going to use the wrong word. When the, when the parable when the parable of the Good Samaritan, when the, when the Samaritan takes the wounded traveller to the public inn, there is a word for that, and he uses it. It's not the word here at all. The word that's used here is for a guest room tacked on to the posher, ordinary homes of the day, whether it's on the roof or whether it's tacked. There wasn't one available for Jesus. There was, there was no room in a guest room for him. I know, it's rubbish, isn't it? That's not God breathed then. No. Pardon? That's not God breathed. No, it's not. The originals are. And that's a really important thing. See the point? Yeah. Our translation is conditioned by our culture. Always. 
of our, our, the things that we hold are conditioned by our culture. And what we're doing here is we're trying to say, let's look at that. Sorry if that's disturbing. But what we're doing is we're polishing the ring. Uh, yeah, so ordinary people. Can't think it's okay, I'm back to it now. I've, I've picked up my thread. Um, ordinary people. You couldn't be a Pharisee if you were an ordinary person. You couldn't please God in that system if you were an ordinary person. You have to have money to be able to live like that. Sadducees, exactly the same. You have to be part of this rich temple elite yeah, to be able to do that. And Jesus is coming to ordinary, ordinary people. And he's saying, come on board with God. The kingdom of God has come. The, you know, repent and believe the gospel. You are welcome. You people are welcome. And that's a radical, radical thing. Ordinary people of Jesus. It's coming and living amongst ordinary, ordinary people. That is revolutionary. And, and then here come the shepherds. Shepherds. Now get this clear. In this time, this is the first century AD, okay, shepherds have become very disreputable. I know David was a shepherd, Moses was a shepherd, those were in different days. But in this day and age, by the time we come to the first century AD, shepherds were a disreputable bunch of people. Now this is a story I'm telling against myself, so brace yourselves. Um, <clears throat> in my first pastoral charge, okay, uh, the first baby came on, David was born, and we were ministering to some interesting people. They were, I loved them, dearly, right? but they were kind of not what I was used to, even at that stage. And David was born, the baby was there, and there were some youths that came from our youth club and knocked the door. And they brought a present for the baby. Can you believe it? And I remember to this day, wobbling, saying, what do I do? Do I want these guys in my home? Do I want these guys seeing what i got in my living room? Do I come back and make it on a Sunday when I'm out? sort of people you don't associate with. He's being heralded by the sort of people you don't associate with. And here's this nice home in the city of David, you know, with, with a guy who is of the house and lineage of David, and here comes the local robbery to the door. And they welcome us. It is not that some local countryside and land management executives who happened to be engaged in a pasture management project in the Judean, Judean foothills turned up. What you've got here is a bunch of yobos. <laughs> yeah, the guys who, when they were in the town, you lock up your daughters. They're those guys. And they come and worship Jesus. Who's come into an ordinary situation and an ordinary home to welcome the ordinary people. Shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. Dodgy bunch. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them. Something new is happening. And the glory of the Lord shone round them. And they were terrified. But the angel said, don't be afraid. I bring you good news that will create great joy for... Ha, ha, ha. Got it there? All the people. All the people. Even you, pesky peasant. Shepherds, today in the town of David, a Savior is born. He's the Messiah, he is the Lord, and this will be a sign to you. You'll find a baby wrapped in cloths lying in a manger. Are they, are they going to be surprised by that? See, see, we tend to think a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in a manger is an unusual thing that marks the baby Jesus out. But in, in fact, for them, it was their standard. It was absolutely normal to them. It is God coming amongst them and doing what they do. The Lord wasn't going to be found in a governor's palace or a wealthy merchant's guest room. He's going to be found in an ordinary but good peasant home like this, in the living space. In the most suitable crib to be found, the well-stored manger, he was to be found in a two-room house rather like their own. Now, I'm going to give you the pictures. Now, the pictures are not good. Tell me so. So I, I sort of took a photograph of a book and I sort of emailed it to myself on my phone over the Wi-Fi and 
because I was rushed, I'm sorry. This is not great. But here's a picture of the palace ar archaeologically dug up and present in the 50s at least, still in Palestine. So there's a, there's a continuity. Sometimes you see people say, well, in the East it's like this, and there's no continuity demonstrable between what they're saying about what it's like now and what it was then. We have archaeology. So I'm, I'm making the link to you so you can see, yes, it's not just in the East today and projecting that back in time, which would be nonsense. And we have these dug up. And you'd have a house, typically like this, perhaps on a little bit of a slope, and you'd have the family living space, and then down steps into the other house sort of thing, um, stably bit. And then in the night, the animals would be brought in here, into the living room, so looking down on it, and there'd be mangers excavated out of the floor, there'd be these hollows in which fodder was placed, and then there'd be uh, different ones for the sheep. These are for cattle, if they had any cattle, and then the ones for sheep are like the standard crib that you see, with some bedding material in it which would normally be fodder for the animals. Make sense? This is a family living room, and it's got like a raised platform here, they'd sleep on that, but the animals would be in here at that, because they're too valuable to be here. If, you, if you've never slept, <laughs> this is going to sound creepy, um, if you've never slept in the same space, right, there's a bunch of stuff like that, don't know what it's like. Certainly when we were showing cattle and showing sheep and stuff, we'd sleep in the lines, sleep in the cattle lines at the show. And it was just, it was really nice, actually. It was quite warm. <laughs> and it was a great way to sleep. And it's not, it's not bad, you know. I mean, it wouldn't bother on the duvet, right? But, but, do you know what I mean? This is not some awful thing that's going on here. This is the standard for the ordinary people of the day in a good home. Now, what would the guest room be? If they had a guest room, there'd be a guest room on top of that or at the back somewhere. But there was no room for them available in the guest room. And so they were taken, not, not shoved out in the stable somewhere, they were taken right into the heart of the hole to be cared for. Does that make sense to you? <coughs> Today the angel says, in the town of David, a saviour has been born to you, he is the Messiah of the Lord, and this will be the sign, you will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying. sign. This is not that far off standard practice, except that they're in the heart of the home. And as if one angel were not quite enough to persuade of such a huge forthcoming event, they sent the choir. The way they do with evangelical preachers. Okay? So suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to those on whom his favour rests. That is the shocking bit. God's favour is resting on the ordinary. And when the angels put that one, gone into heaven, the shepherd said, Well, that's a surprise. God's favour resting on ordinary people. God is for everybody. Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that's happened, which the Lord's told us about. Tremendously important thing in the New Testament explanations of Jesus. This is not some freak event. This is something that God has planned from time past. He embraced the ordinary people. He sent his son to live in this way. And here's how the Old Testament scriptures are fulfilled. Not something done in a corner. Not something done freakish off the wall. God is doing what he said he would do. And he's restoring the kingdom to all of Israel. The inclusiveness is the thing. And because of what we've tried to make of Christmas, we've made it about exclusion, not about inclusion. Mm. A family takes the baby and the mother, the baby that's going to be born and the mother, into the heart of its home. I don't know where the guys went. What do you mean? Send them to the stable? It's more likely. <laughs> Send them to the pub? I don't know. Obviously, they rush it out and the ladies take over, don't they? That's very proper, is the way we look. Um, but uh, suddenly we departed from that standard. Uh, but uh, that's not in the Bible. You know that, don't you? That's me. Um, so basically, what we've done is we've taken this story that is all about inclusion, and God.
God including all people. And made it a matter of the exclusion of the Son of God. Now he did humble himself. And he did bring himself down. The way that he did that was by taking on our humanity. And that's, that, that's enough. That's enough. That was huge. God including his own being in human form so that all men A really good guy posted something on Twitter last night, I think it was earlier this morning, and, and, and he said, um, the incarnation is about having God with flesh on, God with skin on, God with skin on, which is good, but it's not entirely that, because it's God with humanity on, that's a lot more than just skin, that's a lot more constraint on the divine nature, that's a lot more humbling of God himself just skin, isn't it? It's all about humanity, our weakness, our frailty. And he does it in this way. Well, I hope we kind of tried to polish the ring a bit, and I hope it helps in some ways, and I hope it helps us to get a bit closer to the heart of things. Um, because the truth, actually, also 